An overview of the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, verse 14, through chapter 5, verse 11. Messiah begins his public work. In the ninefold structure of Luke's Gospel, we come to section 4, Jesus' mission, Messiah's message and work. Galilee had a mixed population of Gentiles from Syria and of Jews from Judea. Note the location of Capernaum, about 20 miles north of Nazareth. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, and on the Sabbath he taught the people. They were amazed at his teaching, because his words had authority. We'll note below in what consisted this authority. The events in this part of the Gospel are not in strict chronological order. Learn to name the main provinces moving from north to south. You have Galilee in the north, then Samaria, then move down to Judah, (coughs) and finally into Idumea. And from west to east, Samaria or Galilee to Decapolis, and to Perea. Our story begins in Galilee, a region north of Judea and Samaria, at the town of Capernaum, where Jesus will teach in a synagogue and cast out a demon. He will enter Peter's home, where many will come for healing. He will then leave, as he said, I must go proclaim the kingdom of God. He then came to Nazareth, where he meets his first public rejection in his hometown. Then we will deal with the call of Peter, who becomes a full-time disciple. For the chronology of the Gospels, see any Bible dictionary or the book Life of Christ in Stereo by Cheney. Now, in Luke's Gospel, there is a strong focus on the ministry of Peter because this Gospel and the book of Acts were written for churches founded by the Apostle Paul, who insists that his Gospel is completely one and consistent with that of Peter. For already, in the latter half of the first century, there was some tension between churches founded by Paul, by Apollos, or by Cephas, Cephas being the Aramaic name of Peter. The great synagogue at Capernaum may have been built upon the site of the synagogue that Jesus came into. In the synagogue there was a man possessed by a demon, an impure spirit. He cried out at the top of his voice, Go away! What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, Jesus said sternly. Come out of him. Note that the spirit world was quite aware of who Jesus was, employing messianic titles such as the Holy One from God. To expel demons does not require a great deal of time, repeated visits, or the use of religious symbols. Just simply, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, command spirits to leave, and they will do so. Then the demon threw the man down before them all, and came out without injuring him. All the people were amazed and said to each other, What words these are! With authority and power he gives orders to impure spirits, and they come out. And the news about him spread throughout the surrounding area. Now Jesus came performing many of the works 
showing that he was the Messiah predicted in the Hebrew Bible. Go to the website to find a document listing 31 biblical predictions about a coming one. An important facet of the Messianic ministry would be that of healing diseases and casting out of demons. Psalm 91 said, You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. These dangers were known in the surrounding pagan countries to be titles of demonic spirits, and Psalm 91 was addressed to the Messiah, for even the devil quoted it to Jesus in the previous chapter. The Messiah would reign as king in the royal lineage of David. He would pour out the Holy Spirit as predicted by the prophets and would eventually instore a worldwide peace under a new heaven on a new earth. Jesus left the synagogue and went to the home of Simon. Now Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever, and they asked Jesus to help her. So he bent over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. She got up at once and began to wait on them. At sunset, the people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sickness, and laying his hands on each one, he healed them. Because of restrictions upon travel on the Sabbath day, folk waited until sunset at the end of the Sabbath to begin coming. Moreover, demons came out of many people, shouting, You are the Son of God! But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew he was the Messiah. Jesus did not want evil demons to identify him. Rather, he wanted us to recognize who he is by what he did and what he said. At daybreak, Jesus went out to a solitary place. The people were looking for him, and when they came to where he was, they tried to keep him from leaving them. But he said, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because that is why I was sent. And he kept on preaching in the synagogues of Judea. Now there's a problem. Was not Jesus in Galilee? How then was he preaching in synagogues of Judea? The earliest Greek manuscripts actually read synagogues of Judea. Eodias. But by the 5th century, some scribes were writing synagogues of the Jews, Idodion, and yet others, synagogues of the Galilee, Galileas, or simply their synagogues. Now the name Judah dates from antiquity. First, Judah was one of the twelve sons of Jacob. And in the Iron Age, there was a kingdom in the region ruled by the House of David, according to pagan inscriptions, also called Judah. Eventually, any territory inhabited by the tribe of Judah took that name. During the Babylonian captivity, the region was made a province. Those who came from Judah were called Judeans, or in English, Jews, for short. The Hasmonean and Herodian kingdoms were likewise called Judah, the Hasmoneans being the descendants of the Maccabees who revolted against the Greek Syrians. And from 63 BCE, there was a smaller area made a Roman province. In popular usage, the word could cover Judea, Samaria, and Idumea. And in 132 CE, the Romans merged Judea with Galilee to form Palestina. What is this 
kingdom of God. Jesus said that this was a good news message and that the kingdom of God came accompanied by divine healing. He said that those who believe in him would see it before they died. In fact, he often proclaimed, The kingdom of God has come near to you, or has come to you. In one verse, it has come upon you. Even so, it had a future manifestation as well, but currently was coming or arriving without celestial signs. At one point, Jesus simply said, The kingdom of God is in your midst, referring to himself. Thus we conclude that the kingdom of God comes wherever King Messiah goes. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Note we have reference here to the Spirit, to the Lord in heaven, and to Jesus Messiah on earth, a kind of trilogy or trinity. He is especially concerned for the poor, the prisoners, the blind, the oppressed, announcing that the time of the Lord's favor has come. In reference to Elijah's visit to a poor widow up in the Syrian region, Jesus continued, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time, when the sky was shut for three and a half years, and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. What an offensive thing to say in the Galilee, where there was such tension between the Sidonese and the Judeans. Note that Sidon was just to the side of Galilee. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built, in order to throw him off the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went away. What made them so furious? Jesus had referred to their own scriptures. Now the society at that time was oriented on the dimension of honor versus shame, whereas many Western societies today are more oriented to questions of innocence and guilt. And yet other societies to those who possess power, in contrast to loss. Those who enjoy honor, innocence, or power tend to become arrogant, whereas those who feel shame, guilt, or loss will become angry. One day, as Jesus was standing by the Lake of Gennesaret, or Lake Galilee, the people were crowding round him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, 
the one belonging to Simon, otherwise known as Cephas, or Peter, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. It was customary for teachers to sit, but to stand while reading scripture. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. The poor this time had to earn enough money not only to survive, but to support the elite class. The elite in every society capture other people's wealth through these main means. First, the charging of rents, which are usage fees on land, building, and equipment. Then there were the taxes, official fees that had to be paid to the government. Then there was usury to pay to the bankers, interest on loans. Brokerage is the middleman who increases prices when he resells. Expropriation is when the government or other elite claim to have a right to confiscate the property of the poor. Serfdom was agricultural servitude. The landowner took as much as your harvest as he wanted and you had to live on what he left you. And slavery was legal bondage, in which a master took everything that you produced. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. If you teach this text to others, then you might make these observations. Notice Peter's transformation. To begin with, he was fully occupied with life's demands. But he began to listen to Jesus' teaching. He was doubtful of what Jesus said, but was willing to try, then was astonished at the outcome, whereupon he repented of his own evil, but was reassured by Jesus' promise. So he left his economic security and followed Jesus at all costs. You and I are called to do the same.